Okay, so uh, I think uh, we finally figured out how old I am. I, I'm so old, I, I remember when the, uh, uh, the portable radios had vacuum tubes. And uh, then I remember also when the transistor came in and uh, that changed uh, many things. Uh, so we've had the transistor I, th I think uh, we just heard my birth date is 1946. I'm one year older than the transistor. The transistor was invented exactly uh, one year after that. So I look at my age, I subtract one year, and that's how old the transistor is. Now, unfortunately, that means that I am quite old, and also the transistor is getting old. And we, you would think by now, with all the modern technology, we would find a replacement for the transistor, something better. And so I will try to explain the effort. This was a part of a, a 10 year uh, program within the United States uh, National Science Foundation. Uh, essentially find a replacement for the transistor, if you can. And uh, so I will try to explain our search. And uh, you can see that the, uh, uh, the organization that I was leading, we had a nice acronym, E raised to the power of three S, energy efficient electronic science and uh, to find a replacement for the transistor. And this is kind of an interesting challenge. I mean, it affects all of us because we all use electronics. And uh, can we do it better? Is there a better way to do it? So here I show you the cross-section of an early integrated circuit. And uh, you see that there are transistors at the bottom. Uh, but most of the circuit is made up of wires. I can just sort of trace the wires. They sort of go round, and if you follow them up, they go here. So there are wires everywhere. Uh, an, an integrated circuit is mostly wires, uh, very few transistors on it. And it benefited enormously from miniaturization. So miniaturization was um, uh, named after uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, so uh, Mr. Moore envisioned that miniaturization would change everything and would uh, give us uh, millions and now billions of uh, transistors on a single chip. And so each transistor uh, costs uh, uh, maybe a tenth of the minus nine pennies, okay, or, uh, or euros or shillings. Or, uh, it, it's very inexpensive and uh, we have uh, so many of them and this is part of what uh, we have become accustomed to. But there's a problem with miniaturization, and the problem is we kept making things smaller and smaller, and finally today we are making transistors that are hardly bigger than molecules. We can't make them any smaller. And people are worried about this, and this is how the worry comes about. I, I borrowed this slide from a computer scientist in my department, and uh, he, um, he explains how everything got better and better in computer science. And uh, he, his name is Patterson. He invented uh, reduced instruction set computing, but he thinks that's a big improvement. And then he says, oh, wait a minute, we can't do much more miniaturization, and we have other limitations coming in, and now the uh, improvements have uh, come to an end. And so the question, and, and he's right, I mean, if, if we don't have new discoveries, uh, we, uh, we will not see th uh, that much improvement in computers. In fact, the laptop I'm using to project this image is a rather old one. It's from 2010. Uh, it's, it's almost as good as a new one. So the, this is the big question that is being asked, and it affects everybody uh, on the planet, is what's going to happen now that we have reached the end of miniaturization? Uh, what can possibly happen? Uh, so I will try to answer it from the viewpoint of we will look for an improvement to the transistor. It has to be a major improvement or nobody will care. But something else happened in the meantime in the uh, past few years uh, that is partly answering this question. And so I, I have to tell you about that and probably you've heard about it. It's uh, the emergence of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence uh, is an idea that started in the 1950s and um, it never worked. People would study it and study it, and it seemed to make uh, no impact. And then uh, a very big change occurred in 2012. For the first time after over 50 years of research, the artificial intelligence started to work. 
And uh, the reason why it began to work is that uh, huge resources were applied to artificial intelligence. For example, they would have tens of thousands of microprocessors. And uh, they, the artificial intelligence, it has to learn from something. So it was given the whole database of YouTube images to learn what pictures look like. And they trained the computer to identify uh, pictures, to um, identify, for example, animals and, uh, and flowers and things. And, and, and now it can identify uh, people. So it's, uh, the privacy is out the window. You could walk on the street and people could identify you and then look up your web page. They would find out all about you before you take the next step. So uh, this is uh, artificial intelligence. Now it has some good applications too. And it is used, for example, to interpret x-rays. It is actually better at interpreting x-rays than any one radiologist because it has the wisdom, the training, from perhaps 100 radiologists. So the, the artificial intelligence is, uh, uh, is better than a, uh, a medical doctor. Uh, now, when it first happened in 2012, everyone got very excited, and they said this was a big breakthrough in computer science. But then, very quickly, by 2015, it was realized that we shouldn't use ordinary computers to do this. Uh, that, in fact, most of the mathematics in artificial intelligence is uh, uh, linear algebra. So it's just mathematics. So uh, people said, well, we just need specialized equipment that just, do, just does that exact formula that's needed for artificial intelligence. And in 2015, if you had this idea uh, and you went to uh, Silicon Valley and you asked investors, I need money for this, at that point, uh, they couldn't believe that uh, this had anything to, to do with hardware. So with great difficulty, one of the companies was funded in 2015, and it, was, it became the modern trend in the past four years, hardware accelerators. And these are machines, they're hardware machines that uh, simply are specialized exactly for the mathematics that you need for artificial intelligence. And uh, in mathematics it's called matrix multiplication or linear algebra. And uh, so it has now become the biggest trend. Uh, the latest trend is for machine intelligence, optimization, deep learning, etc. So all the things that uh, are uh, possible in artificial intelligence are made possible, are now much faster because we have uh, specialized hardware for this. So this is very good for people like me who are interested in hardware because uh, it, it meant that there was a, a lot to do. And in fact, I have here a photograph of the biggest supercomputer in the world. And it's uh, uh, located, at least at the time when it was built, it was the biggest. And it's located uh, in the United States and it's called Summit. So if you look at it, Summit Supercomputer, and there's the name Summit spelled vertically. And uh, this supercomputer is more than 50% artificial intelligence accelerators and less than 50% super, uh, uh, normal supercomputer. So in the future, there will never be any more supercomputers of the old type. All the supercomputers in the future, they'll have part of it as a normal computer, but uh, most of it will actually be artificial intelligence. So it's regarded as a very important uh, scientific trend. And it is a combination of von Neumann architecture and neuromorphic architecture. So the von Neumann is what you have in your laptop, and neuromorphic is this artificial intelligence. Uh, now, uh, so uh, this is the biggest thing happening in electronics today, and uh, many companies are starting, but interestingly, they're not software companies, they're not computer science companies, but actually uh, most of them now are uh, doing specialized hardware. Uh, for uh, artificial intelligence. So I'm going to set that aside because if you look at those machines, they're still running on transistors. And so the question still remains, what can we do to make the transistor better? So we have an idea that there's going to be a lot of progress, but it's still uh, fundamentally based on transistors. How can we change the transistor? So I have here a picture of the transistor. So the transistor is where you connect a wire here and the current flows this way, it goes here, and it is collected. And in between, we have an electrostatic gate. So with negative charges, 
So the negative charges repel electrons. So these are electrons going through. If you repel the electrons, you turn off the transistor. And it's really not much more complicated than this. Uh, it is basically making a barrier to the flow of electrons, which is you put negative charges and they repel electrons. It creates a barrier to electron flow. So uh, that's how a conventional transistor works. So somehow we have to come up with something better. So I put together a team to do this. And first, I have to show you what the problem is. So this is, this is interesting. What's wrong with a normal transistor? So with the electrostatics, with all those negative charges, I made a barrier. And if I have enough negative charges, the barrier gets higher. And I have electrons which want to flow. But in order to surmount the barrier, they have to have enough energy. And in order to have enough energy, they have to uh, overcome the Boltzmann factor. So I will mention in my talk various important Viennese scientists. Okay? And so the first is, is uh, Ludwig Boltzmann. And he said that, uh, yes, to jump over the barrier, uh, you can do it, but you need a lot of energy to get over the barrier. And uh, if you want to turn off the flow completely, the barrier has to be very, very high. Uh, so uh, that's fine. But uh, we look closely at the uh, Boltzmann factor, and we see that you need a lot of voltage to stop the flow of current. And actually, in the transistors, as they were 15 years ago, it required one volt to stop the flow of current. And um, now you say, well, we've had 15 years of progress. Surely, we must have improved that. And actually, it improved maybe by 10%. So if you, if you put a voltmeter inside your laptop, now it takes 9 tenths of a volt. That's not a very much big improvement. Uh, so uh, w why so much voltage? It, it has to do with the Boltzmann factor, uh, that this voltage is 25 millivolts. And you need, when you turn a transistor off, you have to turn it off by a million to one. And the reason is that most of the time, transistors are, are just waiting. For example, on your keyboard, maybe you don't touch uh, the Q very often, the letter Q. And so the transistor, the transistor is waiting and waiting until you finally hit the letter Q. So you want to have very low leakage. So to have low leakage, you need a very big voltage because you're fighting this thing. And the scientists here will know this is 25 millivolts. And you need a million to one, so you end up needing a, a voltage of maybe three-tenths of a volt, and then there's various inefficiencies, and so it ends up requiring one volt. But l let's say the Boltzmann factor says, if that was the only problem, we would still require three-tenths of a volt. And so to turn the transistor from off to on, we would need to apply a voltage of three-tenths of a volt, actually in practice, uh, nine-tenths of a volt, and say, well, how can we improve this? This seems like we need a lot of voltage. So we said, well, well, let's make it more sensitive. Let's invent something new that is more sensitive. And so we say, oh, it will require less voltage to turn it on, and then even less and less. And finally, it requires oh, maybe only 10 millivolts to turn the transistor on. If we had a more sensitive transistor, it could operate at a lower voltage. Now, how much lower? So it could be much, much lower. Because in electricity, we have a signal. We are trying to fight noise. So what is the noise voltage? And so noise is usually microvolts. And we are using one volt. We're using much too much voltage. So we can, let's say we reduce to 10 millivolts. That would be 100 times less voltage than in your laptop. Now, 100 times less voltage, the electrical people here will know that the energy goes as voltage squared. So we have the possibility of reducing the energy of electronics by 100 squared, which is 10,000 times less. Now, that's noticeable. That's a huge improvement. That's similar to the improvement uh, from miniaturization of uh, transistors. So it suggested a, uh, a fantastic opportunity. All we need to do is to make a more sensitive transistor. And then we get 10,000 times less energy consumption. So it seemed like it should be uh, doable. Okay, so there's 
there's the challenge and also there's the possible way of doing it. So in effect, if you look at a normal transistor, they have a, a, a way of uh, expressing uh, the uh, sensitivity. So this would be a normal ideal transistor would be 60 millivolts per decade. Now, those of you who are uh, uh, more into this, you'll, you'll rec you won't recognize this, but it, it's basically the Boltzmann factor. Is, is the, uh, the, uh, this is, uh, in, uh, per decade, for every factor E, you have 25 millivolts. It's exactly what, what Mr. Boltzmann said would happen. That's a conventional transistor. Uh, but what we're looking for is we want to make it more sensitive, so we want it, the response to be sharper. So that's the goal. Uh, now, uh, part of this, uh, you have to think of what, what does this, the transistor do? And people say, well, it does logic, it's smart, it, it does smart things. But I think of it a little bit differently. I think of the transistor as a communications device because uh, what happens in an integrated circuit is that you have wires, they're going everywhere, and uh, it's basically uh, signals. You're basically using the transistors to drive electricity on wires. And why do you have wires? Because you need to communicate. Now, usually when we talk about communication, maybe we think about long distance communication, maybe a phone call. But in this case, it, the biggest problem is that you just have to communicate a fraction of a millimeter. And that's already a difficult problem because you have to charge these wires. You have to put electricity on these wires and it does take quite a bit of current. And it takes voltage. So if you are charging these wires to one volt, uh, you pay quite a bit of energy. But if you can provide the function and charge the wires only to 10 millivolts, then you save 100 times in voltage and you save 10,000 times in energy. So uh, I think of the transistor as communication along wires. So what are the things that we need? If we're going to invent a new transistor, I spent most of my time talking about sensitivity. We want it to be more sensitive, so one millivolt, maybe 10 millivolts would be enough to turn it on and off. But the other thing I, I already mentioned is when you turn it on and off, it has to be by a huge factor. Okay? And the reason is most of the time, most of the transistors, they're just waiting for something to happen, so they leak, and you want to turn it off completely to make sure they don't uh, consume energy by leaking. So you need a, a million times uh, turn off. The leakage should be one millionth of the on state. And then there's one more requirement that is a little bit hard to explain, is that uh, in the on state, the, uh, the new transistor has to deliver a lot of current. And the reason is it has to charge up all those wires and it wants to do that very quickly because you want the, the, uh, your computer to operate very rapidly. So you have to provide enough conductivity. So these are the three main requirements that you have to fulfill. So, uh, it, and this sort of shows a more modern uh, cross-section of a chip. It gives you some idea why you have to provide current. Uh, these letters M, this is metal 11, metal 12, and so forth. There are actually 14 levels of metal in your PC, if you bought a modern PC. There are 14 levels of metal. You have all of these layers. This is, we can't even show you number 13 and 14 because they don't fit. And you can barely see number one down here. But at the bottom on that dot, can you just make it out? There's a little red dot that you can barely see. That's the transistor. And that transistor has to supply, supply enough current for all of those wires. And that's why that becomes one of the major requirements, supplying conductance. And uh, so uh, that's the third requirement. Uh, so in effect, uh, what we're doing is where we're, when we look at today's devices, uh, they're working and it takes quite a bit of energy, but there was a, a, a theoretical physicist at IBM by the name of Rolf Landauer, and he said, uh, no, 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 it, it should be related to, the, to uh, this thermal energy due to the Boltzmann factor, and that in fact, at least 10,000 times improvement in energy is possible. From where we are today, to what was foreseen by Rolf Landauer. So uh, I've said this a few times now, we need to reduce the uh, energy consumption. So about 10 years ago, I put together a team to invent a new transistor, and these are some of the members of my team. And of course, I uh, chose 
uh, some members from my own university, which is uh, Berkeley, and but I went to the top universities in the United States. Uh, I would go to Europe, except this was the National Science Foundation, so it, I could only go to American universities. And uh, so I went to MIT and to Stanford, and we put together a team, and everybody agreed we're going to try to invent a new switch that could replace the transistor. And uh, if we did that, it would have a big effect on everybody, including everybody here, uh, that we have um, uh, all sorts of electronics that we've become accustomed to. I'll, I'll mention, uh, for example, cell phones, uh, and uh, I'll mention self-driving cars, uh, the, um, but we also have uh, uh, the Internet of Things, that the Internet is going to be connected to everything. Uh, your refrigerator, everything. And then we have even more importantly, uh, the body-centered networks. So I have one of these, maybe you have one of these watches that is measuring my pulse. And uh, this is becoming more common and it measures more physiological things and it gets networked and my pulse is distributed through my cell phone, it's sent up to the cloud. And uh, maybe 20 years from now, uh, the doctor will want to see what my pulse was today, yeah. just in case. And uh, so th this is becoming a part of everything. This, this is your data centers, uh, where there's huge energy, cons energy consumption in data centers. Every web page you download is from a data center. Every time you check your email, uh, they consume megawatts of energy. And then there's the new thing, artificial intelligence, also consumes a huge amount of energy. So we need to be prepared for that. So to prepare, I asked the team, uh, what shall we do? So we decided upon four possibilities. Now, why four? Because if we chose one, it might be the wrong thing. So we chose four. And uh, still might be wrong. We don't know yet. And we have different approaches. So one approach is to invent a new semiconductor device. It's just like the transistor, but more sensitive. And that would be good because then you could maybe replace the transistors directly and it would be accepted immediately by industry. That's one approach. Another approach is to make mechanical switches. So mechanical switch, this is like the wall light switch. It's mechanical, but it's on the nanoscale. It has a gap of two nanometers. And uh, the uh, new idea there was to fill the gap not with vacuum, because if you fill it with vacuum, the two metals will stick to each other. So we separate it by uh, a, a molecule and we compress the molecule. And so uh, we had a, a fancy American name for this, it's called a squitch. Okay, and so it's a squeezable switch. So that's, uh, 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 that's uh, one of the ways of, th that could be a replacement for the transistor, but it cannot do everything. It's, a l it's too slow, but there are many applications where speed is not that important, including the Internet of Things. Uh, then another th idea was to use magnetism. Now, my team, they wanted to transmit information by spin. And, I, well, spins are okay, but they actually don't go very fast. They go roughly at the speed of sound. So I said, uh, change your idea a little bit. And the one thing that's very difficult to replace, I showed you two slides ago. I showed you the wires. The wires are not going away, okay? And the, uh, the wires uh, work much better than any uh, wire for spin. So you need to have it electrical. So the idea became uh, the following, that you would uh, put in some electric current, and there's a new discovery that was made about 10 years ago called spin orbit torque, and a very small current can cause a non-magnetic metal to become magnetic on the surface. This was a very important discovery because it's completely non-magnetic. How could it happen? Uh, but it does, it requires very little current, so it's more sensitive. And then already it was discovered uh, that a magnetic field can change resistance. So uh, uh, this was uh, joint magneto resistance. So it has current in, and you have uh, a biased resistor, so you have current out. So in and current out. And you could have gain. And still electrical, because you need the wires. And, but inside the switch, it's magnetic. So it's, it's very interesting. It fulfills many of the requirements. It's very sensitive, but it's very difficult to turn off. It's made of metals, and it's very hard to get uh, uh, a high resistance in a metal. But uh, nonetheless, I'll indicate what they've done. And then there's one more option we considered. I showed you all those wires, 
And uh, this is something new, is to replace the wires with optical waveguides. It's called silicon photonics. Uh, it was noticed uh, by myself and others that silicon is very transparent to light, so why not use the silicon as an optical waveguide? Uh, so uh, we had the idea of doing that, but then we needed uh, something more reliable than lasers, and so we have taken an LED and we've attached an antenna. So unfortunately in physics they don't teach very much about antennas, but uh, uh, it, after a hundred years of radio antennas, we are finally adopting optical antennas. And they make the, uh, uh, the LED, the light emitting diode, becomes very fast, as fast as a laser if you attach an antenna. So uh, we're looking at optical communication to replace uh, the, um, the wires. So that's the only thing you can really replace wires with is other things that go at the speed of light. So let me quickly uh, go over the different approaches. This is if we could find a perfect replacement for the transistor. Now, we have to overcome Mr. Boltzmann. So we have to say, yes, Every transistor works by Boltzmann. How can we find a principle that does not rely upon Mr. Boltzmann? So to do this principle, I will uh, show you something that came from Mr. Schrodinger. So probably he's another uh, uh, Viennese Austrian guy. So Erwin Schrodinger said there's energy levels, okay, and they're perfectly lined up. And when they're perfectly lined up, the current flows. And then I misalign the energy levels and the current stops. I realign them and the current flows, and then I misalign them. So this principle does not rely upon uh, the Boltzmann factor. This is a, a different principle for switching, and it relies upon uh, quantum levels. So I will say I will use Mr. Schrodinger to overcome Mr. Boltzmann. Okay? So this looks good, but you'll see that, that it's, it's uh, somewhat challenging to implement. Now, if you did this, you could just replace it, do a one-for-one -one replacement, and you would defeat the Boltzmann factor. Okay, let's look at our other options. Nanomechanical switching. So uh, this is uh, quite interesting, and uh, uh, it's, it's taking an electrical switch but making it on the nanoscale. And you, as your insulator, you want to have a molecule, and then you apply a voltage, and you apply voltage, it, the voltage attracts the wire, so it attracts the wire, the molecule gets squeezed, that's why it's called a squitch, and now the, the, the electrodes are closer together and the current is able to flow. And the current flows like this and down like that. And this shows roughly how it, uh, it switches the current. It's, it's an effective switch, it can be uh, quite sensitive, and it's being uh, very actively pursued by our partners at, I, at uh, MIT. Okay, so the squitch, is a candidate, but it's mechanical, so it doesn't really fulfill all the requirements. So uh, let's go on. Well, let me just show you uh, the uh, close-up of the squish. This is a gold rod. This is gold. It's gold wire, and the uh, current goes uh, from here, goes into the gold wire, comes out here, and then is controlled by these two electrodes. Are controlling these? They're called gates. They uh, they like opening and closing a gate to let the current through. Uh, so that's good, but it doesn't fulfill all the requirements. So let's go on. Uh, what about uh, the nanophotonics? So we have an idea of having silicon waveguides, and actually this, is, uh, this was commercialized in a company that I started called Lextera. It was the first company to do uh, silicon photonics, and it could, be, uh, it could be very sensitive. It is superior to wires uh, in, in, for longer links. And uh, the idea was that we would use an antenna, LED, to uh, uh, drive the light through. And it would be very, very fast. And it, it has actually already been proven to be uh, as fast as a laser. So it's, it's quite interesting. And the, uh, speed, up, uh, the, uh, the speed up from the uh, antenna is about, the optical antenna is about 250 times. So it's now as fast as a laser. So, that's good, but uh, it's better than the transistor only for long links. You don't want to use uh, photonics for short links, so it's a partial solution. And this shows the, the first electrically pumped antenna LED, and it shows here the enhancement factor. It's about 200x, 
So we, we got a, a good speed up to the spontaneous emission from the antenna. But it's incomplete. Uh, so let's go to the next possible solution, a magnetic switch. So magnetic switch, it's, uh, uh, it relies upon recent discoveries in magnetism, but there's also a new discovery I want to bring to your attention. Uh, normally, well, first of all, you have all experienced uh, magnetism because up until a few years ago, your laptop had magnetic storage. One of the things about magnetic storage, the speed is not very fast. It's uh, maybe six gigabits per second. It's good enough for the, your laptop, but it would be uh, much better if it were, uh, if, for example, in a switch, you need to be at least 100 times faster. So the reason why magnetism is slow is, let's say I have a magnet and I want to uh, rotate, uh, I want to change the magnet from magnetism up to magnetism down. It takes time because the, the way to switch a, a, a magnet, you have to apply a magnetic field and it goes, goes very, very slowly. And so the speed is not very high. Uh, so uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, leaders in our group, uh, Professor Boker, he discovered a very fast way to switch a magnet. And the way he switches it is he uh, heats up the electron gas the magnetism goes away, and when it reappears, it reappears on, with the opposite polarity. So it's very surprising. There's this alloy where if you apply uh, energy to, the, to this alloy, the magnetism switches. And it's done essentially by quenching the magnetism with the energy, and then it reemerges in the opposite direction. So it's, it's quite interesting. And it actually is, it is 100 times faster than normal magnetic switching. So it's very exciting. He proved it first with a laser, and then he proved that the energy can also come from simple electrical pulses. And so uh, this, is, this is good. Congratulations to uh, Professor Boker, a completely new way to switch a magnet. And so it is a, uh, a potential way of uh, driving uh, circuits but it has a little problem is the, uh, uh, the resistance does not change by a very big factor. Uh, maybe it only changes by a factor of five. That was good enough for a Nobel Prize, but it's not good enough uh, for, um, uh, for uh, our new switching device. So it's, it, is, um, it never quite turns off. So it, it is failing one of the requirements. I should say the Nobel Prize was awarded when the, when the resistance changed even by 5%. That was already good enough for Nobel Prize. Now they've improved it by a factor 100, 500 percent, which is five times. We need a million times, so it's not quite there yet. So let's look at my preferred alternative, which is a new semiconductor switch, which fulfills all of these requirements. Okay, and it could be a one-to-one -one replacement, and I'll show you the switching principle, the one that over overcame Boltzmann. Uh, this is on. And this is off, on and off. So, good. We switch. Looks looks like it should work, and uh, the. Uh, but what happens in reality? So I'm, I'll show you what happens in reality. Is we it in our imagination? It looks like this. We have these very sharp energy levels, and the current flows. And then when we switch it off, the current should stop. But let me show you what happens. Is that every energy level? in the quantum energy level, it's never perfectly sharp. And it has, it has some fuzziness to it. And the fuzziness I represent here, uh, it's, the fuzziness is called a line shape. So I'm gonna try to represent it here. And it is sort of going around like this. And you see, it, because of the fuzziness, it has a certain width associated with it. And so uh, uh, this, is, this becomes a very big problem because the lines are not perfectly sharp. The quantum levels are not perfectly sharp. So what happens? Well, I can, uh, my tunneling, my current, could jump from the tail of this energy level. It can jump to the tail of this energy level. And you think your switch is off, but it's not really off. There's still leakage because the, the uh, spectral width. So this basically converts the problem of making a transistor to a problem in spectroscopy. This is for the specialist. Spectroscopy is just a study of how fuzzy are your energy levels. Okay, so I said, well, we need to make these energy levels very sharp. What can we possibly do? So suddenly electronics became spectroscopy, which is the study of energy levels, and particularly how sharp they are. And so, um, 
I go to our, our physics department and I say, uh, tell me what you know about how sharp spectral lines are. I go to a very good theoretical physicist and he says, oh, I know the answer. He says, uh, it's uh, called, a, uh, it's a Lorentzian. Every spectral line is Lorentzian. Now, Lorentzian is uh, this mathematical shape. It looks like, uh, they all look similar, uh, but you'll see what the difference is. And where does it come from? It comes from Mr. Fermi. So Mr. Fermi, he gave a very famous approximation, uh, but people forget that it's an approximation, and it's called Fermi's Golden Rule. And what it says is that when uh, an energy level decays, it decays uh, exponentially, that it follows this mathematical law, which is at a, at a constant rate. And if I look at the spectrum of this, it, it has uh, this particular spectrum. And if I believe my theoretical physics friend, he says everything is Lorentzian, then it's hopeless. You could never make a new transistor on this concept because uh, the Lorentzian has uh, very uh, strong uh, wings to the spectrum. Let me kind of show it here. Uh, let's see if I have a nice picture. Uh, here's a nice picture. So if you had a Lorentzian, the line is very broad and you can never turn it off. The leakage would go on forever because uh, this uh, falls off mathematically as, uh, as a square. And let me get rid of this. I need a real parenthesis here. Whoops. And it falls off as a square. That's actually a very, uh, very weak fall off. You could never turn the transistor off. What you need is something that falls very, very steeply. And it has an exponential spectrum. In fact, everyone who works on uh, this type of transistor, they assume that it will fall off exponentially. But they, they haven't spoken to the theoretical physicists who are going to warn them, no, it will fall off uh, just with a simple algebraic uh, form. So what determines the line shape? So if you have a quantum dot, let's say this is one of the quantum dots, and you, want to, and, and you say, oh, well, it's not perfectly sharp. Well, why is it not sharp? It's not sharp because it's exchanging electrons are being exchanged with a wire. You always have to connect a wire to it. You want it at a sharp level, but you, you don't have it. And so you have to understand very well how the wire tends to make the, uh, the line fuzzy. So what I've shown here is incorrect. I show a sharp line, but it should be a very fuzzy line. And uh, so we have to understand how a wire interacts with a quantum level. This already is uh, quite an interesting scientific challenge. So I showed you this slide already, which says the leakage will continue unless you have a sharper spectrum. And if it was Lorentzian, which is that uh, form that comes from uh, Fermi, you can never turn off the uh, transistor. And this, uh, this is yet another indication. Lorentzian is you're following uh, Fermi's golden rule, and this is what you hope for, and you have no idea how to get there. Okay, so you need spectral lines that are sharper. Now, I know there are atomic physicists, and I have something for them. They always measure the line shape. If I would have asked an atomic physicist, he would also say Lorentzian. Um, and it is sometimes a good approximation in atomic physics. I have gone to atomic physicists. I said, why don't you measure way down here? This is many orders of magnitude into the wings of the spectrum. And they usually don't measure there. It's harder. There's much less light. So... We need to overcome Lorentzians. So what is the problem with the Lorentzian? First of all, it's not steep because it falls off as one over delta omega squared. It's a rather weak fall off. And you never, it never turns off. So you've already failed on the two big things that you needed to succeed in. You have failed. And uh, so uh, that means Lorentzian is hopeless. So uh, we have to be saved. So how are we going to save ourselves from Fermi? So first we had to defy the Boltzmann factor, and now we have to defy Mr. Fermi. So he had this approximation that when you have, uh, let's say, an electron in an energy level, that it falls off exponentially. This is the red curve. However, uh, what Fermi put forward was only an approximation. If you look more carefully at the quantum mechanics, there's an initial period where the fall off is actually falling off as... Um, with time. This is now plotting versus time. So this is time. With time, it doesn't immediately start falling uh, linearly the way uh, an exponential would. It actually falls very, very slowly initially. 
and follows a square law. So there's an initial parabolic period of time. And there's actually an initial delay before the conventional Fermi's golden rule begins. So this is going to help us save the uh, tunnel transistor, that initial time. Nobody ever talks about it. Everybody always assumes that it's exactly what Fermi wrote. Okay, but we have to deviate from Fermi. Now, if we take into account that initial parabolic decay, this, this little part here, if we take that into account, the spectrum changes. This occurs only for very short times, which means it occurs at big frequency shifts. So way out in the uh, wings at big frequencies, what it, it gives you, this very rapid exponential decay, which is exactly what we need for a transistor switch. We need it to turn off. So we can overcome Lorentzian by recognizing uh, that uh, I won't say Fermi was wrong, but let's say Fermi has been misinterpreted. Okay. And so we've overcome Boltzmann and we've overcome Fermi. But it also says something important about Fermi's golden rule is that it, there's not one lifetime. There's actually a second lifetime that represents that initial period, this initial period down here, which controls exactly how the tail, the, uh, the high frequency tail of the spectrum decays. Now, it seems that at this point, I've become very technical and only the other physicists are following me. So if you want to slow me down or get me to explain things, please interrupt and uh, I'll be happy to uh, uh, follow up. So, so well, we, we, uh, who, who, who understands that there's this parabolic thing? Because I'm defying Fermi. It's bad enough that I defied Boltzmann. Now I'm defying Fermi. Does anyone know about this? So, well, if you go to a normal quantum mechanics book, uh, you won't know about this. So you have to go in greater detail. And, and then you go then to a great master of the subject, uh, which is uh, Claude Cohn-Tonucci. And he wrote a quantum mechanics book. Uh, he doesn't really have it there. But he wrote another book called Atom-Photon Interactions. Uh, Claude Cohn-Tonucci, he is a uh, Nobel laureate in France. And he, he gave us a warning here and I've highlighted it in yellow. And he said, uh, basically, at short times, the exponential is rounded and um, will have a continuous derivative, okay. Uh, it appears that at short times, the uh, probability does not decrease linearly, but rather quadratically. So uh, he is obviously a very smart guy and he already kn knew about this. And uh, for the physicists here, I have uh, sort of an example. Uh, they, uh, this is in every quantum mechanics book that I've chosen one by another Frenchman, that when you derive the Fermi's golden rule, initially you get a um, quadratic decay of probability. So that's uh, quite important. Arguably, uh, Fermi knew about this because he warned us it was an approximation. At short times, you go quadratically. And this sort of shows what happens. This is the uh, technical formula that uh, Fermi derived. And this is at short times, uh, it goes as time squared. And at long times, it just goes with a constant uh, uh, probability. And then it has to do with the width of the density of states that determines the, uh, the second time scale. So this is for the physicists. So how do we implement this? Is, well, it won't work in the usual picture. In the usual picture, you have a quantum level and it interacts with the metal. The metal has many, many quantum levels. And if you look at that interaction, Fermi's golden rule would be correct. So we have to defy Fermi's golden rule. Here's how we do it. Uh, we have a normal metal wire, that's fine. But in order to connect up to the quantum dot, we need a very narrow band metal. So this is a metal in which the effective mass is very heavy. And if that's the case, uh, that uh, you have then this narrow band and it says your transistor, your connection needs to be the special new type of metal which is a v with very heavy electrons in it which we can make and I'll, I'll show you how we can make it. So do not try to make an electrical connection with a normal metal. Uh, it will, um, it will uh, uh, cause the transistor not to work. So this becomes a requirement and if you fulfill this requirement, you get this nice parabolic shape initially, which is determined by that narrow width of that narrow band metal. 
and it rescues the tunnel FET. Uh, it gives you this uh, very rapid uh, spectrum, and it also solves a problem in physics that has existed for at least 60 or 70 years. And I'll uh, try to uh, show that. I think it might be coming up. Oops, it'll come up in two slides. But there is something called the Erbach tail. And uh, it's a, it was an unsolved problem in solid state physics. So, uh, and this is just a reminder. I'm showing the slide again. You need to overcome this problem. You need to have a metal with a very heavy mass. Now, one of the complaints that people make to me, oh, if it's a very heavy electron, it's going to be a very slow transistor. And uh, actually, that's not the case, because uh, as, as heavy as it is, or as light as it is, it always has the same condu conductivity. It's called the quantum of conductance. It's 27 kilo ohms. And uh, if you make these, uh, it's similar to a carbon nanotube uh, transistor. You just pack them very close together to get the conductivity you need. So. Uh, then you go and you predict the uh, current voltage relation, and this is very good for a transistor. This is a very nice fall off, and this is what's assumed. Everybody in tunnel FETs assumes that it would fall off exponentially, but it never performs, and they're getting this. So we have this uh, new requirement. It came from the line shape question. So how does this uh, impact other parts of electronics? So, in fact, in a solid state, in the world of condensed matter and solid state, the uh, Lorentzian spectrum is very rare. Much more common is that, this is for the case of gallium arsine, it absorbs, it absorbs, and then suddenly it drops off exponentially. So the exponential spectrum occurs in almost every material. And there have been many explanations for this. But they're always very specific for that one material. But it's universal to all materials. I'll give you another example of how you use this every day. I mentioned optical communication, which is how you connect to a data center. And uh, we uh, download our web pages. We store our information in the cloud. It's all done with optical communication. Now, if you believed in the uh, Lorentzian, uh, and I give this as a homework problem to my students every year, I say, if you had a Lorentzian, so Lorentzian would look something like this. It would fall off very, very slowly. And then the, I say, how transparent would your optical fiber be? How far can you go in an optical fiber? And if they do the homework correctly, it's one meter. So if you believe in Lorentzians, the optical fibers would be only transparent enough to go one meter. Of course, we can go many kilometers because uh, this... Uh, uh, exponential tail applies also to optical fibers. So this is very surprising and uh, that has never really been explained as why is glass so transparent that it can be used for optical fibers. And we think that uh, uh, the, this exponential spectrum, well we know experimentally it's seen in glass as in most materials. And so we need a universal explanation. It doesn't matter if it's amorphous like glass or crystalline like gallium arsenide. Uh, so uh, I'm sort of gratified that it applies in that situation. So uh, this is sort of a new feature of Fermi's Golden Rule. Some uh, narrow band final density of states, uh, initial quadratic decay, and exponential line shape. So this is a quick summary of what I've said. I have a prediction for atomic physics. So in atomic physics, the, uh, the atomic physicist, uh, especially you, Anton, uh, 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 they like to put atoms into cavities. And so we make a prediction that if you have an atom inside a cavity, that the uh, side emitted light uh, will not be Lorentzian, that it will actually have a very much sharper spectrum. So I encourage that as yet a further application of uh, these ideas. Uh, this has not been observed yet, so uh, uh, I'm uh, hoping that the atomic physicists uh, will see it. Now, how are we going to make uh, the, uh, this narrow band metal? So there's a, a new type of semiconductor that emerged very recently. It actually emerged uh, from a chemist in Switzerland and uh, uh, simultaneously in Germany. And they are making what's called graphene nanoribbons. And uh, they are really polymers. They have nothing to do with graphene. 
uh, but the, you can make a uh, molecule, you can polymerize it so that you make sort of a narrow wire like this, and these are uh, individual units. I, of course, polymer chemistry is quite amazing. You, you have the individual molecules, and you, uh, you, they start automatically to make a chain, and uh, then you change the monomer, and then you make the chain wider, and then you make it wider yet, so you make a quantum dot, so you end up with two quantum dots, and the wire connecting it can be exactly the narrow band metal that we need to uh, make the tunnel fit uh, uh, successful. Uh, so I say it is uh, nothing to do with graphene, it's more in the spirit of molecular electronics. Molecular electronics has existed for uh, maybe 20, 30 years, but they never knew why they were doing it with molecules. Now I've, I've given them a reason to do this with molecules, and it looks like it uh, should be uh, possible. And it's not made by starting with graphene, it's made by simple polymerization, which um, the chemists are accustomed to. So I have a team uh, working on this, and uh, Felix Fischer is the uh, organic chemist, and uh, we, we have a, uh, a, a solid state theorist, he has to come up with the band structure, so we need a band structure of a heavy metal, and we need someone to make the devices. And uh, so it is a, a bottom-up synthesis, it's literally a chemical synthesis, and it, uh, you, you make these molecules. And uh, what's great about this is that the organic chemist can put a dopant, like in semiconductors, we put dopants in at random. And he says, no, 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 we have a deterministic dopant. That's a boron, that's a boron, that's a boron. They don't come in at random. They come in at exact locations where the chemist put them. And so in this way, we can make uh, very interesting uh, new types of metals, new types of semiconductors and so forth. And this is, uh, this is one of the, this is a Swiss chemist who uh, came up with this synthesis procedure. And the nice thing about it is you can check it with uh, uh, scanning, tunneling, microscopy. You can actually see the actual structure. And uh, this is how it looks like in a rough uh, uh, scanning tunneling uh, micrograph, but you can actually re resolve the individual chemical bonds. You can actually see everything. And the, the states that contribute to the metal are at the interface between the wide and the narrow region. And some, pe some people call this topological, but it's, it's simply happening at the interface between uh, two types of polymers. So it happens here and here. And they're close enough the electrons can tunnel across, and, and there are many of them, so it, become, it becomes the narrow band metal wire that we're hoping for. So uh, the pieces are there, but it's going to take a lot of work to uh, actually make this. So normally in a scientific talk, I finish and I say, okay, uh, that's it, it's, it's kind of uh, hard to do, but they, people ask, okay, when can I expect this new transistor? Well, it's, a, it's very challenging. Because let me go back for that one. You have to make these things, you have to make them perfectly. Uh, you have to make them like a pharmaceutical where every molecule is perfect. And uh, then you have to find a way to um, uh, fulfill. There are many requirements you need to fulfill. And uh, one of them, of course, in the end, you have to be able to mass produce it. We're very far from doing this. We have not made even one of these tunnel transistors yet that is successful. We made many tunnel transistors, but none of them has worked yet. But it, it will eventually work because we're, we're discovering the requirements. So uh, this will not appear in your laptop, uh, in your next laptop. It'll take, um, it'll take quite a few years. So let me summarize. Uh, it looks there's, like there's a path. Uh, but it means we have to overcome the uh, Boltzmann factor, okay? If we're successful, we'll reduce the energy consumption in electronic circuits by 10,000 times. So that makes it a very worthwhile goal. Uh, but we have to understand spectroscopy. So spectroscopy is a whole separate field of science, normally separate from electronics, but now it has to become part of electronics, uh, especially with regard to the fuzziness of quantum levels. We have to understand that better. Uh, now, uh, we accept the Schrodinger tunneling, which helps us to uh, uh, turn the device on and off, but we reject the naive form of Fermi's golden rule. So I've, I've worked on enough names of enough famous physicists in this uh, conclusion. Uh, and, uh, but then along the way, we solve the Erbach tail puzzle, which has been a puzzle in um, condensed matter for uh, 60, 70 years. Uh, but it's very difficult because uh, you have to uh, 
uh, you have to develop these new types of semiconductors, these polymers, and uh, uh, that is a big uh, technical challenge. So it's going to take time. Uh, so with that, uh, let me uh, invite questions, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>